get started tonight. It's a little bit after six. Um, but first off, I'm Brianna Allen. I'm the Communication Outreach Coordinator for the CSC. Um, thank you for all coming to our last Science Fed last semester. We will not be having one in January, but we will be kicking back off in February. So stay tuned for that, and I think it will be back here again. So also, we just want to thank Fox and the Hound for having this amazing taco bar and just hosting us tonight. So thanks to them. So <laughs> yeah, round of applause for them for helping out tonight. I know they're, they're busting their butts to get everything ready tonight. So um, it's, we, have, we are in for a treat tonight. We have Dr. Robert Forbes talking about the political fairy tales on energy policy, climate change, and Lubbock's capacity for renewable alternative electricity. So that's going to be good. So I have the honor of introducing Robert tonight. Robert Forbes is an assistant professor of political science at Texas Tech University. He received his BA from the University of Texas, but we won't say anything about that. <laughs> and received his Master's of Public Administration in 2004 and PhD in Political Science from the University of Utah in 2010. His research interests are primarily concerned environmental politics and policy with emphasis on the policy nexus of environmental protection and energy development. His research specifically addresses political conflicts triggered by the hydraulic fracturing energy resource development progress. He teaches courses on public lands and resource management, sustainability, energy, and environmental policy. So without further ado, we help me welcome up Dr. Robert Forbes. Okay, so as Brianna uh, talked about, I, you know, bachelor's degree from the University of Texas, uh, master's PhD from the University of Utah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was that? Oh, you can't hear it. Okay, you hear it now. Is that good? All right. All right. Wow. All right. Wait. Test, test. Do not eat the pink acid. All right. All right. Can you hear that? Okay. So, bachelor, bachelor's degree from the University of Texas, master's and PhD from the University of Utah. But I have to, you know, kind of give you the background a little bit. Um, I'm a native born son of Wyoming. Uh, my hometown is Cheyenne, Wyoming. So one of the reasons that I've got interested in this way back in the day is because I grew up in the culture of energy development in a state that is heavily dependent in terms of their fiscal resources um, with energy, as well as cattle ranching. And as we'll come to find out, we'll talk about a little bit more, um, the idea that states are fiscally dependent on fossil fuel development is inherently important to the idea of know how we gravitate away from fossil fuels and towards alternative renewables um, so one of the things that I want to talk about in terms of the, and this is a, a, a nod to Ken Baki from the Department of English when I was talking about fairy tales one of the things about fairy tales and folklore is that the United States government the federal government including state governments we subsidize folk economies so when we talk about the idea, when I teach my students in, in public land resource management, the idea that we're going to give the land away, we're going to provide timber at an incredibly cheap price, if we're going to provide mineral resources at an incredibly cheap price, if we're going to lease energy development of both fluid as well as solid mineral development, we subsidize it. We talk about agriculture, we subsidize it. So that idea that we, we, we fund a folk culture, right? So the idea of the cowboy culture, which is what I grew up in, is one of those things that's inherent. And my first job out of high school, I'll be honest with you, was out in the oil patch. The idea that you stake your, your claim you have the concept of a miner with a pickaxe over his shoulder. You have the idea of uh, Paul Bunyan and, and uh, you know, Blue, the, the Blue Ox, uh, Babe, the Blue Ox. So in terms of timber, if you talk about, you know, farming, the idea that you go out, and you, you run the land and you grow things and you are self-sufficient. Um, if you look at any natural resource with, with regard to that, we basically have paid to sustain over the, over, the, over the time that the country was founded this idea that you can make your own way. 
Well, you can and you can't, because it's expensive to make your, your way in the world. And so what we've done is we've subsidized. So when we talk about homesteading laws, it's free land. It's the idea that we're going to get pennies on the dollar per the acre. When you talk about mineral development, and it still harkens back to this day because the 1872 general mining law has not been reformed to this day. You can literally go out and stake your claim on BLM lands, forest lands, and pay pennies on the dollar. When we're talking about grazing, oh my God, I mean, the idea that what you pay in public grazing and compared to private grazing is pennies on the dollar. When you talk about the idea of a mineral lease, it's pennies on the dollar. And the return is, well, it does derive public benefit. And that's why we subsidize it. This is going to be important as I go along in my talk tonight, that you understand that we are subsidizing these clusters. But what's important to understand is that those of us who look at energy policy, we understand right now we are going through a historic shift. If you think historically in terms of energy resource, well, where do we begin? Well, we begin with wood, and then we move to coal, and then we move to oil, and then we move to natural gas. Right now, according to Bloomberg, we are in an historic transition to alternative renewables. So this, what, I, what I aim to do tonight is sort of dispel some of the myths and how that relates to climate change, because it's really important to climate change. So, I like cartoons. I really love cartoons, because political cartoons are satirical. They cut through it. They, in many ways, dispel, dispel the myth. They dispel the fairy tales. So, as you can see, I don't know if you can see in the back, but anyway, this is Obama standing on the South Korean DMZ, and the balloon above his head says, looks desolate like going back in time 50 years, no electricity. And someone standing next to him and says, well, that's a green economy. This is a, it's a myth. The green economy, we'll get into this a little bit more as we move along, the green economy will produce jobs. The green economy is actually beneficial to sustaining not just simply the environment, but sustaining our political, social, and economic institutions. And that's really important to remember. This is real. This is a poster that was distributed last year in the state of Utah uh, for Earth Day. And uh, it was an elementary school contest that you're going to bring posters to like, well, where would you be without oil, gas, and money? It wasn't, it wasn't the idea of like, how do you combat climate change? Where would you be without oil, and gas, and money? So in terms of like, when we talk about fairy tales, when we talk about folk tales, what are we talking about? We're talking about children's stories. We're talking about the idea that we're going to grasp onto these easy concepts. Right? But one of the things that I find most entertaining about anything I do, and I've done this since I was a graduate student way back in the day, um, do me a favor and just shout out the very first thing that popped into your head when you saw that word. And those of you who have had my class, and I see you, you're not allowed to participate. Those of you who are, those of you who've never seen this, you're allowed to participate. So, what's the very first thing that popped in your head when you saw the word environmentalist? Shout it out. Al Gore. Al Gore. Tree hug. Tree hug. What's that? Radical. What's that? Shout it out. You guys are way in the back. Talk about me not being able to hear. What's that? James Wan. Oh, James Wan. Really? James Wan? He's environmentalist. <laughs> Weirdly enough, he's actually a cousin of mine. Anyway, go ahead. Any others? Seriously, guys. I mean, just shout them out. I don't care. I've heard it all. Birkenstock. Thank you. Granola. 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 What's that? Green. You can't do music. This is my wife over there. She knows this. You're not allowed to participate. Others. What's that? Oh, Rachel Carson. Okay, Rachel Carson. 
communist. Thank you. <laughs> this is what my chair warned me about when I was told him I was going to do this presentation. He said, you know, you're promoting a communist agenda. Be careful. You're going to need some Kevlar. Any other? There's a ton of them out there. Farmers and ranchers. Farmers and, oh, here we go. Farmers and ranchers. And that's the distinction. Some of my favorites have been Go Right. So if you're a believer in climate change, you're you know an acolyte of the brother Al Gore. So you're a Go Right. Um, the other one I've heard, which is my all-time favorite, is the Granola Mafia, which my students have labeled me as the Godfather of. And we have actually developed. I have developed. You know this sort of process by which you get. We open the books. And we admit you in. You swear uh, an oath of a morta to, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the monkey wrench gang. Um, you, we burn a picture of uh, John St. John Muir in your hands. Um, any hit that's taking place is, you know, done by uh, trail mix. You know, <laughs> I mean, we we figured this out. This whole idea, but the idea is, like you said, being ranchers and farms. You hear people say, well, everything in trending, trending normally is the way that you go to the left side of the political spectrum. But at the end of the day, nobody talks about farms, ranchers, nobody talks about industrials, nobody talks about ATV riders, nobody talks about snowmobile riders, nobody talks about um, the hook and bullet crowd. And the original environmental group was the Boone and Crockett Club by Teddy Roosevelt. What we've come to understand is that in terms of social constructivism, we have attached myth and symbol to defining the term environmentalist, but at the end of the day, if you deconstruct it, everyone, no matter what their political spectrum or their political beliefs might be, or where they land on the political spectrum, is an environmentalist in one way or another. We all have a land ethic. We all understand that the environment is important to us because it's Mother Earth. All right, so you have Barry Commoner who tragically died a few years ago. And this idea, you know, the idea that technology, we're not having a democratic discussion about technology and how it's employed with resource development. So this is, and I hate to say this is sort of a Marxist lens, but it is. And Barry Commoner basically says, today's product exploitation of nature is much more concealed, pervasive, and threatening. Tied to the core processes and technology of capitalist production, the simple regulation of capitalist and willing to suffice. If those technologies are to be altered to conform to environmental needs and natural process, the means by which those decisions about production and technologies are made will themselves have the change. We do not have a democratic discussion about any of the technologies that we employ to develop fossil fuels. And the poster child for this, oh wait, I gotta go back. Sorry, this is, this is one of my um, advisors from way back in the day. So when I got interested in this, it was way back in 2004, and I lashed on to hydraulic fracturing in 2004, early on. So one of my advisors actually said, energy policy, one of the last rats nests of public policy that has for too long gone unaddressed by political science, and you're just the type of idiot we need to crawl down that hole and attempt to entangle. <laughs> well, for the last basically 10 years, that's exactly what I've tried to do. Based on my dissertation, drill baby drill, I mean, why not? The idea that in 2000 we were going to expand energy development to the point of interfering with the rights of property owners. And you had ranches across the Rocky Mountain West, which is where I was from, that were coming into conflict with energy developers. That is something unusual because if you, if you think about it, in terms of like the coalitions that affect policy, energy developers and ranching organizations have always been aligned with themselves. They have always opposed the environmental credo, the environmental stakeholders. One of the things that was interesting that happened after 2000 when they ratcheted up the leasing programs and the approved permits drill process, the APD process, was that 
ranching organizations were beginning to seek out environmental organizations in order to protect themselves from hydraulic fracturing, the expansion of hydraulic fracturing. For anybody that grew up in the West or even West Texas, how likely is it that ranching organizations are going to align themselves with environmental organizations? So it's like mixing oil and water, literally. And so there was a handful of us that looked at that and said, what the hell is going on out there? And that's what kind of spawned my interest. So based on that research, as well as Dr. Keir, who came out of Colorado State a year after myself, we've had many conversations. We agree. And our research basically points to it. There's four dominant variables that shape energy policy, one of which is energy markets and economies. So in 2000, what was the price of barrel of oil? It was like creeping up on $200 a barrel. What's the price of a barrel of oil today? 38, 36, somebody said 36. Did it really drop to 36? $36 a barrel. So you've got a market incentive. The other thing you have to have is the technology and the feasibility, which means that it has to be practical. It has to be profitable for you to actually put it out in the field and use it. So this goes back to commoners' argument that we don't have a democratic discussion about it. We just put it out there. We know we have it. We're going to go ahead and use it because we need it. Third, energy law and regulation. At the end of the day, you have to have a body of law and regulation that will allow for the technology to be used for the purpose of energy development, energy exploration and development. Fourth, you have to have the politics. You have to have the willpower to put it through. So early on in 2000, you had the election of Cheney and uh, Bush and Cheney. <laughs> yeah, Cheney and Bush. Um, Bush and Cheney. So you had the election of Bush and Cheney. And immediately following their being sworn in, they had a, a, a closed door meeting that was held. It was the Energy Policy Forum, basically. And two days after the report was issued, they issued executive orders. And executive orders basically demanded that you were going to ratchet up the leasing process, you were going to ratchet up the APD process, we were going to conquer the idea that we were approaching $200 a barrel of oil. The public was demanding of it because we were creeping up on $350, $4 a gallon for gas. Um, so there's public behind it. And it basically moved through the Congress. You have to have a friendly Congress to do it. At the same time, wielding unilateral executive powers, he's appointing very, very pro-development persons within the DOI, the Department of Interior. He's got the Secretary of Interior Norton. He's got Rebecca Watson. Um, the undersecretary's name, I can't, because he was the anonymous source <laughs> in my dissertation, I can't name it. Um, then you've got the, the, the head of the BLM, who's ex actually executing Secretary of Orders, saying, you will do this. And all hell breaks loose in the West. And this is where we come with fracking. This is where we get hydraulic fracturing, the explosion. This is where we get the controversy. In terms of the sub-government policymaking environment, which is what we use, well, we look at Congress and congressional authority, congressional committees. Well, who's heading the congressional committees? Mostly in terms of natural resource and energy development. Those are persons whose states, whose interests are tied to the energy industry. So they lead these committees. So they're favorable to the laws in terms of the regulation, so on and so forth. Then you have, in terms of a shared political agenda, you have the president and executive authority who rules the administrative agencies. They can issue executive orders, they can wield executive appointments, and they can get it done if you've got a friendly Congress. And then you've got the regulated interest groups. That these are competitive hierarchies. And within the agency that I was looking at in terms of the Bureau of Land Management, what I was looking at was that traditionally ranching had actually dominated the decision making, the policy making environment of the BLM. And what I was seeking to understand was how, did, how has that shifted? Has it shifted? I had to ask, has it shifted or has it not? And at the end of the day, when you're talking about modern energy development, yes, it has. And there's a whole lot of other factors and conditions and variables that play into this. 
But at the end of the day, everyone agrees that the BOM is basically semi-captured in terms of their policymaking environment by the energy interests, and they are no longer dominated by the ranching interests. Ranching is subservient. And guess who's on the outside? Uh, the energy interests. Or, no, I'm sorry, the environmental interests. The environmental interests are the outside. But as everyone that I interviewed articulated, and we're getting into this a little bit, big alternative renewable energy programs were threatening that dominance. If we had a friendly president, if we had a friendly Congress, if we had the body of law which with them they could work in, then predictably, you could understand that possibly, quite possibly, we were going to shift again in our energy policy. That's the idea of causality at the end of the day, and whether or not you can actually prove it in another circumstance. So, we get to the lens in terms of the sub-government. Well, you have the Energy Act of 2005 that those of us who, who do this work um, refer to as the Halliburton loophole. Well, in 2005, we basically, we, we allowed for the hydraulic fracturing process to be immune from every environmental law that had ever been passed in the United States. And that's only in terms of the development process. Now, in terms of the reinjection process and the use of produced water and how they dispose of it, they're still, uh, 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 they're supposed to be able to, they're supposed to be accountable to those environmental laws. But in terms of the development process, no. Clean air, clean water, drinking water act, um, surface reclamation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera down the line in terms of that development process, they are immune, basically. So they carved out that loophole. It benefits them to the great degree. We can talk about you know, the idea of you know, how they did that, but in, in your time, what Dr. Hayhoe, Dr. Kier, and I have come to understand is that there is a direct inverse relationship between the advancement of fossil fuel energy development technology and North American environmental conditions. Now, Catherine would say, and I agree with her, it's not simply limited to North America. It's, it, it, it is global. And you'll see why. Go ahead. So when we talk about fracking across the United States, well, across the United States, fracking is going on everywhere. Anywhere you can find a coal seam, anywhere you can find, you know, tight oil, tight gas deposits, you're going to go in and frack it as long as it's economically feasible. That's the key. But we do have the technology available to us to do this. Go ahead. So, because I'm talking about fairy tales, here's fairy tale number one. Fairy tale number one we've been fracking safely since the 1970s, and it leaves a small footprint on the land. I don't know what spurred me, but we had a water policy meeting across campus a couple of years ago. An environmental engineer basically used that line, which is normally the, the, the industry line that we've been safely fracking since the 1970s, and I got pissed off. I don't know why, but I just did. I mean, junior faculty should not open their mouths really in that regard. Um, but, Go ahead. At the end of the day, what I said was, you and I know good, and this is the way I'm avoiding me, you and I both know good and goddamn well that this isn't grandpa's fracking. We're not drilling a hole, throwing a stick of dynamite down it. This is directional drilling. This is hydraulic fracturing. This is use of chemicals, not diesel fuel. This is the, the use of technology in ways we've never seen before. And it's having an impact that we've never, ever realized. People ask me all the time, is hydraulic fraction good or bad? And I will tell you, when it's done well, it's fine. But when it goes bad, it goes really, really bad. It'll affect your water, it'll affect your air, it'll affect the noise, it'll, it'll affect your house. Federal regulations only require that they're 200, 300 feet off your front door. That's it. So if you're going to drop a well and you're doing this process 
And the other thing is, is it takes 1.25 to 1.75 million gallons of water to frack a directional well. In the mix of that, we no longer use diesel fuel, but we use what's known as fracking fluid. Fracking fluid is a compound of chemicals, most a good share, not most, but good share of which are known carcinogens. We also use sand. I interviewed at, well, this is way back in the day, but I interviewed at the University of Wisconsin um, and Green Bay, yeah, 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 it was ridiculous, but basically they were saying, well, no, I'm sorry, yeah, Green Bay, they were basically saying that we're, Wisconsin's running out of sand. And the reason Wisconsin was using, running out of sand is because we were using sand to frack everything in sight. You only retrieve, in terms of the produced water, anywhere from 25 to 35%, which means that you leave roughly 70% of the fracking fluid, compounds, sand, and water underground. Now, those of you who are into the geosciences will understand that geo geology moves. The ground moves over time, and there is a lack of predictability and understanding how that ground is going to move and how those chemicals and sand and water, that produced water, is going to infiltrate with, with our drinking water. If you go below, it may rise up. If you, if you are above in a shallow well, it may drop down. This is the unknown entity. It's a scientific uncertainty which the industry will and has played upon. That idea of scientific uncertainty, in fracking, we don't know what's going on. So, a small footprint, let me dispel that. My home state in Wyoming, and my favorite place on the planet, which is right outside of Pine Dome, Wyoming, outside of the Wind River uh, Wilderness Range. And the, the, wind, the wind Rivers holds the highest peak in Wyoming. It holds 30 peaks over 13,000. It holds the largest singular glacial formation in the lower 48. It is the start of three major river systems, including the Green, which feeds into the Colorado. And yet, just to the south is what's known as the Jonah Field, which is one of the biggest natural gas plays in the United States. If you notice, from 1890 to 2000, which is the time of Wyoming statehood, 70,000 approved permits to drill. Between 2000 and 2008, 115,000. And by the time 2013 rolls around, it's close to 187,000. So, wonderful people, you can drive across the land, you can look at it from a very vertical sort of sense and, and say, oh, that's only well and well past. This is what it looked like seven years later, that same stretch of land. The roads have been carved. Every white spot you see is a well pad. Every blue or dark spot you see is a retention pond because there's only certain ways that you dispose of the produced water. And one of those is within line retention ponds. And as Oklahoma understands, and reinjection wells. But this is what that landscape looks like in 2007. Anybody who's taking a commercial plane to San Antonio, look out your window, you can see it. This is the small footprint. It's larger than what they're saying. So fairy tale number two. The XL pipeline, the XL pipeline, Keystone XL pipeline, create jobs, benefit the economy, promote energy security, minimally impact global GHG, greenhouse gas emissions, and safer transport energy resources. This is from TransCanada last year. Well, this is what tar sands, the process. So the process is you scrape the land, you dump it into a holder, you run water through it, you heat it up like crazy. Dr. Zach will <laughs> confirm this, um, University of Calgary. So that idea that you heat that up and then you run it through the mill, and what you're left with is bitumen as an energy resource and uh, waste at the end of the day. So what's the process look like? Let's go back to that small footprint. Go ahead. Well, here's the... Yeah, go ahead, one more. Skip. So this is what it looks like. You basically scrape the land. And as climate changes and the northern reaches get warmer and warmer, it becomes easier to develop. But it's also known as one of the worst 
environmental, the most environmentally impactful energy resource development. So we have another form of technology besides hydraulic fracturing coming into play because, again, think about the four variables. The economics of it, the political willpower of it, the idea that you have law and regulation that will support it, and here you go, okay? So, and the lower picture there is one of the retention ponds. Before and after is brilliant. So on the left-hand side, you see a before of that area. On the, and on the right-hand side, you see the after. Below, you have the, the processing plant. And this is what the landscape looks at the end of the day. This is what we're talking about in an inverse relationship regarding energy technology and environmental impact. And one of the reasons we say this is because energy resources in terms of fossil fuels, the low hanging fruit has been gotten. The hard to get fossil fuel resources are what's left. They're incredibly expensive. They require a ton of dollars invested in research and development. And at the end of the day, they really have an inverse impact on the environment and in particular, climate change. So, very challenging three, Arctic energy, which is an area where Dr. Hale and I have just begun diving into. Well, according to the National Petroleum Council and the American Petroleum Institute, um, oil and natural gas in the Arctic can contribute to our future energy needs and the technology drilling tool um, and advances in oil spill prevention and responses to exist and ensure safe and responsible development are there. We're ready to go. Let's do this. Right. Roll that shell. This is this is the one that just put out off the coast of Alaska up into the Arctic, uh, up in the Arctic Ocean. Nine billion dollars. There's seismographic resonance coming off the floor or up the ocean floor was basically telling me there was a huge natural gas and oil deposit. So they spent $9 billion. They tried this two times to get this thing off the ground. $9 billion. Obama, he agreed. He gave the India per permit to drill and off they went. Well, then they drilled and it was an empty hole. The technology is not fully developed, but that doesn't mean that we're chasing it. So if you think about the term chasing the dragon, in terms of like your heroin addiction, this is what we're chasing. This is chasing the dragon. This is the exemplification of that. Go ahead. All right, very gentle four. I don't love this one. Uh, Man-made climate change is. So what you see there is James Hinnock, a hoax perpetuated by Hollywood liberals and extreme environmentalists, used to advance a radical environmental agenda. Um, you've got Larry Bouchon, from, represented from Indiana. Uh, our careers evidently depend on climate change to keep, keep ourselves publishing articles. Well, that may be true. Um, on the other hand, we also have Lamar Smith from Texas, who is basically saying that the models that we have developed have come on, we've, we've come to rely on them, and we've greatly over, overestimated global. And at the end of the day, just this last year, there's still no explanation of, in terms of the percentage of so-called climate change due to human activity and what is due to natural trends. They love natural trends, by the way. Fracking. <laughs> and you're talking about anything that comes up out of the ground that exceeds the, you know, the, 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 the natural occurrence of of, of minerals and, and, and carcinogens found in the ground, it's a natural occurrence. Well, the natural occurrence hasn't occurred there for 20 to 30 years, and the only thing that's changed is you coming in and developing the energy resource. And all of a sudden, wait a minute, all of a sudden those carcinogens, are, the levels are going off the charts. So he's basically saying, and I love this, I only read summaries and describe the reports as clearly biased, and that's the IPCC's most recent, most recent uh, um, a report. Go ahead. So I wanted to introduce you to the Texas Tech University of Hollywood Liberals and Extreme Environmentalists, <laughs> which is the Climate Science Center group, <laughs> because we evidently, you know, go ahead. All right. extreme weather. 
right? By extreme human behavior, only extremists. So if you notice, it's kind of cut off, it says extreme alarmists. So going back to the idea of the environmentalists, an extreme alarmist commie hippo ego terrorist. At the other side, you've got the extreme environmental causes. Here we are today, currently, we talk about our political agenda. We talk about the people that we're listening to, the people that our, our citizens are actually considering voting for. AP, the Associated Press, only in the last month, uh, decided that they wanted to run a study. So what they did was they gave eight climate and biologists, scientists, the tweets and the Facebook remarks and the quotes and so on and so forth, and asked them, in terms of presidential candidates, to grade them like we would any student on a, hundred, on a zero to 100 scale. And at the end of the day, they did it blindly. So they were assigned codes. I mean, just like you would do a blind peer review. Well, the results were that Clinton, Hillary, came in with 94. And I want you to notice, at the, at the bottom is Ted Cruz with six. All eight scientists put Cruz at the bottom of the class. Who's leading in the polls right now? Ted Cruz. And Penn State University scientist said this individual understands less about science and climate change than the average kindergarten. That sort of ignorance would be dangerous in a doorman, let alone a president. I, I'm going to give him his credit. I think he really meant to say doorknob. <laughs> but at the end of the day, what we're talking about are people that we're going to elect. People who are going to have the idea of climate change, the inverse relationship that I've been talking about in terms of energy development technology, the political willpower to use it, and they do have the law and regulation on their side to keep going. All right, this is Catherine. This is Dr. Hayo's number. So this is, well, not her number, but IPCC. So what does it mean in terms of climate change? Well. Global average temperature, the blue line, which is roughly 2.6, and what Catherine refers to as the very tail story of climate change, is that we only increase by 2.6 over time. And then you've got the most extreme, which is 8.5. Well, if we're talking about carbon emissions, I want you to notice the green line, as opposed to the dark red line. The dark red line is a business as usual model. So if we're continuing to burn fossil fuels at the same rate that we're doing, we're continuing to explore and develop those fossil fuels rather than shifting, well, the 8.5 model proves true. The only down course on that green line is if we shift our economies to the greatest degree, I will never ever say that we're not gonna need oil and gas, we will, but to the greatest degree possible, to alternatives and renewables. That is the only shift that turns the course of time. Go ahead. So, yeah, keep going. Where are we at? The black dots, <laughs> the black dots basically say historical emissions, and they're exceeding the worst case scenario. They don't even come close to the fairy tale scenario. So as long as we keep developing this technology, as long as we keep chasing the dragon, we're going to keep along that line. So, business as usual. Well, this is what happens if we continue. That black line tells us that we're not just going to exceed 8.5, but we're going to exceed 3% every year and far exceed the 8.5. So, Catherine and I laugh sometimes because people ask me as well, does that mean the end of the planet? No, it does not mean the end of the planet. What it means is that we will no longer exist on the planet. The planet will continue to do its thing, but we won't be there to witness it. Go ahead. All right, fairy tale number five, and I love this because, you know, God, the first time I encountered the mayor, I really, wow. Anyway, <laughs> all right. So we reached our capacity, which is what he said recently in August of 2015 with regard to wind. 
It took me forever to find this quote, by the way, but I did find it. And he basically says we're going to be at a point that we're bumping up against the cap of how much wind we can have in our portfolio anyhow. So, I don't know. There's nothing more we can do. Uh, I don't know. I just think time is wrong, again, because so much uncertainty at the federal level. How long are these subs even going to last? Uh, everyone, everyone has realized that wind is not the answer all to bar. When you get too much, you can get, I swear to God, too much wind in your portfolio? Really? All right. Um, until we solve the technical problem, how you do store this excess energy from wind, we're not able to use it as it's being produced. And we may have reached almost a point in West Texas where we're saturated with wind farms until we come up with better technology. All right, he's your congressional candidate. He's also your mayor. And, you know, the good Wyoming boy has to point out to you, he is a dumbass. All right, so go ahead. Subsidies, let's talk about subsidies. So the idea that we, and I've talked about this earlier, we subsidize the hell out of energy out of fossil fuel energy development. We don't subsidize is alternative renewable development. And why would we do that? Because like I said, every new technology that we take into the field to develop a fossil fuel energy resource is expensive. It's harder and harder to get. And the other thing is, is that it comes at a cost. If you, if you add it up, it comes at a cost. So what is alternative and renewables? And this is coming from Bloomberg. Bloomberg basically says, you know what makes the most sense? To harness the energy resources that are free. So here's what it is globally. In terms of a fossil fuel development, globally, the G20, they spend $452 billion on fossil fuel production and $121 billion on renewables. And where's my thing? Okay. I forgot a slide. I forgot a slide. This is from a ranching farming journal, whatever uh, thing. This is a couple in Alabama. So we're talking about a, re a return on your investment, which is Bloomberg is all about right now. And basically, because of the technology and advancement of it and the efficiency of it, your return on investment, your ROI, has been cut drastically. There are all kinds of federal, state, as well as interest group grants and subsidies that are available to you to implement solar. So this is a, a couple in Alabama who own a farm. Incentive programs reimburse the O'Neills for about 70% of their 50,000 kilowatt system, which will quickly pay for itself through the sale of electricity. The initial installed cost, $160,000. IRS tax, tax credit, $48,000. USDA Rural Energy for America grant, 40 plus, 40 and a half plus. Alabama Saves grant, 25. Nexus Energy grant, 3,000. Out of pocket cost from that original 160 was 47,852. Projected annual income from electricity, plus $15,000 a year. Years to break even, 3.19. What they're saying is that at the end of the day, the O'Neills who used to pay $500 a month for electricity now make $15,000 a year selling their energy. This is the future. The idea that we go from big time solar projects and big time wind projects, we're still going to have them. What's happening now is we're going micro, we're going small. 2012, this is a dated, this is a dated chart, and I looked it back up again, again, according to Bloomberg. Basically, what we're talking about is the corporate investment, 640, uh, $674 billion, and to total global in renewables, 281. Bloomberg estimates that we're going to invest in solar alone, $3.7 trillion by 2040. And half of that, 2.1 of it, is going to be for private solar. So where are we at? You have huge municipal monopolies who have now gone to state utility commissions as well as legislatures and they're 
fighting tooth and nail to protect themselves. This started in California. And the reason being is because they were losing customers and they were losing profit. Well, why? Because like the coal industry, they're dinosaurs. They did not see the better mousetrap being built. They are risk averse, unquestionably. At the end of the day, though, if they wanted to stay, sustain their, their business model, well, then they need to take a, a risk. They need to in, in, incur the capital investment. Well, how do you do that? It's not necessarily in big solar or big wind. It's in small. You can purchase, which is private companies in California, as well as in the East Coast, are doing right now and making tons of money on them. They own the solar panels. They're putting them on your house. They run the grid. They negotiate with the public-private grid system. They maintain your solar panels. And at the end of the day, they're making huge profits. Go ahead. So, coal is going away. Right? And considering it's Christmas, I'll throw that up. Go ahead. So, how do you not get alternative energy in your state? How do you not get solar, wind, geothermal, uh, tidal, offshore, anything you can think of in terms of alternative energy? Well, these are very well-funded fossil fuel think tanks who will go to the state legislators, go to the state, go to the federal government, invest a ton of money in terms of the lobbying efforts and their opposition to anything that smacks that is going to oppose the fossil fuel corporations. Kansas, for example, this one simple example. They literally wanted to invoke wind, they wanted to invoke uh, a solar, they wanted to do geothermal, they wanted to do water conservation, they wanted to do mini hydro, all these types of things. And yet, these groups, these lobbying interests, were basically attacking every piece of legislation that was being introduced and countering it with what Catherine is all too familiar, and myself all too familiar with, with counter science. Fallacy, fairy tales. So, West Texas. Have we reached our capacity? This is from the Energy Information Agency. I pulled this off yesterday. This is our potential for biomass. And if those of you who can't see it, it's a focused picture of the panhandle all the way from Amarillo to Odessa, uh, San Angelo, um, and, and further down into El Paso. The little small blue pieces that you see are wind farms. The area where you see the four and the huge biomass is low and surrounding areas. Go ahead. All right. This is taken from a plane coming across West Texas. And all of us are familiar with this. This is Habu, right? This is the wind, this is a dust storm. This is that same dust storm taken from the, you know, the, the window of a plane. This is what we see, right, from the stadium. I took pictures of campus. I found the pictures online in terms of news. You know, some of it. Now, who can tell me what this is a picture of? Mars. This is a windstorm on Mars. Okay. What's been said to me by individuals who will go unnamed is that the reason we don't have solar or have no solar capacity is because it's dusty here. The wind blows, the dust blows, it lowers our capacity for, you know, solar, our potential for solar. Okay, all right, I, I kind of bought into that. And then a couple of nights later, literally like two nights later, I was watching National Geographic and they suddenly just did a story on Mars because they don't just experience localized dust storms, but global dust storms. Go ahead. This is the Mars rover. The Mars rover runs on solar panels. And during the course of a dust storm, it gets covered. And then the wind comes up, and it clears the panels off. And literally, according to NASA scientists, they have to control themselves, because otherwise they're going to burn the batteries out, because they're producing so much energy. Are you telling me that Lubbock is more inhospitable in terms of their environment than Mars. 
Are you kidding me? Go ahead. So what's our potential in West Texas? A lot in terms of solar. I ate a lot. If you notice the graph on the side, just like it was with the, with the biomass, we exceed the capacity. But we do not have solar farms. We do not have, there are eight houses in the entire city of Lubbock who have solar. Eight. That's it. Go ahead. So how do you do this? Well, Michael Giberson, who's with the Free Market Institute at the Rawls College of Business, and I are working on paper. And one of the things that we're talking about is this idea that, like I, going back to the ranching and environmental groups, politics makes strange bedfellows. You have groups that literally refer themselves as the Green Tea Party movement aligning themselves with the Sierra Club environmental groups in opposition to utility monopolies opposing the idea that when you produce energy, they're going to charge you. That you're not going to make money on it. So remember that example I gave you from Alabama? The utility companies are trying to, in a sense, game the free market system. Libertarian conservatives are deeply opposed to this as well as environmentalists because it's a disincentive. And the idea that you should be able to do whatever the hell you want to do with your property is offensive to the libertarian conservatives. So you have this weird alignment where the politic, the political spectrum basically bends into that horseshoe and they begin to align themselves. And this is when things begin to happen, which is important to remember. So think about it in terms of like, if you're producing energy and the utility company basically says, we're going to charge you for producing that energy. We're not going to give you money. We're actually going to charge you. And the only, the other fallacy, the other fairy tale that they tell is that this is going to increase our costs, which is going, we're going to have to impose on lower economic communities. Well, when you go small solar, when you go small wind and you create an energy development entity within a community, well then you buy and sell across the communities. So what's to prevent those communities then to develop a model which they actually go in, which what the utility company should be doing, and sell, put, install, lease, so on so forth. So again, coal, in terms of traditional utility, monopolies, dinosaurs. If they do not change their model, it's, they're done. They're done. Okay. So, wind. It's the other thing, wind. So here we go back to Glenn Roberts and our mayor. Uh, we've reached our capacity. Well, if you notice, it basically says fair and marginal, but if you go to the north and you go to the south, there's a ton of excellent and outstanding areas that have left, that are left to be developed. Have we reached our capacity for wind? Not even close. Not even close. Right. Bloomberg Market News. So here's the shift. Here's the change. This is the market. This is the energy market. If you notice, gas, coal, oil are all on the lower spectrum from to 2030. What you have is solar thermal, small scale PV, solar PV, offshore wind, wind, biomass, geothermal. All of these things are going to explode. You want to know where to invest your money? This is where you need to invest your money, into these entities that are going to go out there on a private sense and develop these systems. Go ahead. So, my chair, I don't even know if he's here. He's supposed to be here. I promised him I'd wear my shoes. Anyway, um, well, sustainability. What we understand no less of a scholar than Eleanor Ostrom, who won the only political scientist who won the Nobel Prize. But she's a political economist, but she won the Nobel Prize and she talks about polycentricity. We look for global solutions when in reality, our solutions are probably best met on a global, on a, on a local level, comprehensively, together. She said, so if we're gonna look at combating climate change, if we're gonna look at shifting our energy development, really in terms of you know, reducing our CO2 footprint, what we need to do is focus less on the global policy and more on the local policy. And that makes absolute sense. So what's been happening? 
Well, these are the principles of sustainability that a lot of cities, a lot of municipalities in the United States, when I say a lot, I'm getting ready to prove it, a lot of municipalities are beginning to do. So in terms of recycling, mass transit, um, energy, building codes, LEED certifications, you name it, go down the list, municipalities are actually implementing this. 85% of U.S. municipalities are, have a sustainable program on, on one level or another. And I really mean to emphasize on one level or another. So you can go from New York City, Chicago, you can go to Salt Lake City, Portland, Seattle, you can go to Austin, Boulder, you can go to New York, New Jersey, you can get all these entities, Miami, they've all got these robust sustainability programs. And then you go down. But at the end of the day, if you look at from New York City to the 1 million plus, all the way down to 100,000, at the end of the day, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, that ends at South Bend, Indiana. You have 295 municipalities, 251 of them have a sustainability department or a program. This is the idea of policy centricity. They're attempting to lower their CO2 footprint, and it makes economic sense for them to do it. The less resources that they're expending in terms of the fossil fuel, fueling of their fleet vehicles, the use of mass transit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, water, replace, one of my graduate students actually proposed, replace every flow, old flow toilet in uh, South Overton and Tech Terrace in that area. And they ran the numbers and the amount of gallons of water and the amount of money that would be saved was astronomical all by replacing a toilet. All right, fine. So, opponents. Transportation, water, economic development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Come on. Transportation, mobility, land use, green building, housing, open space. Go ahead. So where do we begin? Well, you start with zero scale. When I first arrived here and I taught sustainability to an undergraduate program, I had 50 students in the room and only two people understood what the hell I was talking about when I used the word zero scale. I was like, oh Christ, I've really got a challenge here. <laughs> zero scaping, the use of natural fauna, the idea that you can, you know, floor fauna, Chicago, green rooftops. And the upper left hand side is City Hall, Chicago. On the lower right hand side is an elementary school in Chicago. Okay, so what I tell my students all the time, why do I not see green rooftops on Texas Tech's campus? Can we do this? Hell yes, we can do this. All right, go ahead. Global engagement in terms of energy is solar. The upper two, so you've got Germany, you've got shingles that are woven with solar panels, ribbons, and on the lower, this is by old um, political science building at the University of Utah. And what you see there is, is what a graduate student developed, and those are ivy-shaped solar leaves that fuel the entire building. But India's building solar, any flat surface, you can put a solar panel on, and it will produce energy. Germany, Switzerland, solar ships. Go ahead. South Asia, Storage containers off ships, and if they're sitting on the docks, they've got solar panels. You deploy the solar panels, you run the turbines. This is the public safety building in Salt Lake City. It's a net zero building. Net zero. Solar panels, green rooftops, gardens, you name it, they've got it. National High Speed Rail System, this is being built out. And by the way, a high speed rail system was proposed for Texas some years ago. Who opposed it? Southwest Airlines. If Southwest Airlines would have engaged with the government, invested their dollars, and built the high-speed rail, as well as maintained their fleet of airplanes, could they not own the ground and the air? All right, that's what I mean by risk averse. This is public transit in Salt Lake City. You have, you have light speed, you have light rail, all throughout the entire city. Uh, regional rail. 85% of what's referred to as the Wasatch Front in Utah, which encompasses roughly 2. Point, well, almost 2.5 million people, 
runs the regional rail all the way from Ogden, Utah, Salt Lake, all the way down to Provo and Orem. And it's on a medium rail. The idea is that you're going to expand not just simply the light rail, but you're going to expand medium gauge rail to a regional perspective. The idea is that you run it to Boise, that you run it to Jackson, that you run it all the way down to Denver or across the Denver, you run it to Phoenix, you run it to Vegas, et cetera, et cetera. But you run the rail, right? And within those systems, in the big metropolitan and even small metropolitan area, you create hub systems, which means you jump on the rail, and once you reach the, reach the hub, you can get a cab, you can get a bus, you can get the light rail, you can actually rent a bike. It doesn't matter. You can actually drop a credit card down, key in a code, get in the car, drive it somewhere, drop it off. As long as you've got insurance, the city pays for it. The city is, the vehicle is a city owned vehicle. And then you create free fare zones. Those persons, the mass, the biggest people who are going to use the mass transit because of the way you're using it, because of the monies that are being used, you do this, you create fair, free fair zones within the highest density areas. One of the things that was criticized with Utah Rail, White Rail, when they first developed before the Olympics, was that no one's gonna ride. And within six months, they had to add cars because everybody under the sun was getting on the light rail. Light rail systems work. All right, got it. And here's something really interesting. The United States is developing solar paneled highways. So they go back to that example that I used in Mars, and this has huge bipartisan support. There are also companies in Silicon Valley who are trying to develop a battery with an antenna that will pick up on the solar energy that's being produced by these panels that will then charge your electric car. This is coming. Go ahead. Green Sea, Chicago. The lower right-hand side is my favorite one because that's the cleanest alley I've ever seen in Chicago, all right? <laughs> Quite frankly, it's the cleanest alley I would ever see in Lubbock. Why is Lubbock, I, I joke to my friends, living in Lubbock when the wind blows is like living in the landfill because the trash blows around. Well, why is that? Well, one, we have no recycling program whatsoever. The other thing is we put trash bins behind your house, out of sight, out of mind. We don't see it. They're terribly inefficient, right? Walkable neighborhoods, a small neighborhood in Salt Lake. You got art, you got restaurants, you got grocery stores, you got, you, I mean, you, you've got everything you could ever need within a walkable distance of your house. The other thing is that the bus stop, when I was at the University of Utah, I was right across the street. Light rail is four blocks away. If I wanted to get on light rail, it's four blocks away. I did not have to drive a vehicle if I chose, so chose not to. And quite frankly, for the first three years that I was here, I didn't. But Sugar House, which is another walking neighborhood in Salt Lake, but I want, the only reason I use this example is because it literally is seven blocks away from 9th and 9th, my old neighborhood. That's it. So you're walking the neighborhood after walking the neighborhood that has infill between it. So this is Sugar House District, again, right? Urban Gardens in Chicago. And I want you to know the middle right. The middle right picture is an urban garden, garden in the middle of O'Hare Airport. How many urban gardens are in Lubbock? There are few, but not like this. This brings community together. Right. Downspout, downspout Chicago, we, we've heard about this in Texas. Use your rainwater. Use your rainwater smart. In terms of xeriscaping, those are examples of xeriscaping. You know, xeriscaping, everybody talks about the spirit of you know, your yard is ugly. No. If you do it right, it can be gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. And it can run from street after street after street. There is a checklist. Honest to God, there's a checklist you can actually go through. It's easy to do. Right. Keep Lubbock Beautiful is our sustainability program. I would encourage you all to go to this website because what you're going to find there is a letter encouraging you not to flick your cigarette butts onto the street. 
and encouraging elementary school children to engage in a Crayola coloring contest. Outside of that, there's nothing. So when I talked about the range of New York City having the most impressive, or Chicago having the most impressive, the range of sustainable improvements, Lubbock and Town that they've got a sustainability program, but you know what? And again, good Wyoming boy and me, you know, I drink beer and I curse like a ranch hand. They don't do shit. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Time for questions, whoever, a couple of them. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yes. There's a startup company that's based out of California, and, they're, and it actually started with um, Con Edison out of New York, where They've developed a private market, so if you were willing to, you know, invest your time and your effort in, in terms of applying for the grants and applying for the subsidies, well, the tax the tax breaks will come automatically with your, with your tax forms. Um, but these companies literally will come out and install and 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 maintain your solar panels, but not here in Lubbock. They, they're 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 limited in terms of where their business is at. We do not have a similar business model in Lubbock. If anybody wants to make a ton of money in Texas, by all means, adapt that model and bring it to Texas because you're going to make a ton of money. The other thing is that, and I watched this on 60 Minutes like two weeks ago, there's a guy in Nigeria who's impoverished, and they leased him a solar panel that ran his light bulb, which is the meaning of his life. And they had a, 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 a microchip in, in place to where if he didn't make his payment, they just shut it off. But it cost him $150. And all he had to do was lease it and allow the company to come out, put it on his roof, and turn it on. So if they can do that, why, where are we at? So to your question, nothing in Texas exists currently. But you can seek out private entities that do exist within the state of Texas. It's probably going to be pricier than California or the coast. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I drive an FJ still, so it's okay. <laughs> right. You take the Wyoming out of the boy, but you know, I'm the, Wyoming, the boy out of Wyoming, and not the Wyoming out of the boy. Yeah. Right, from an economic standpoint, if we all increase our usage, that's one reason. And if we can essentially do that, that's one reason. So it seems like they do want to balance the cost of the energy. So, in other words, kind of replacing. Is there an inverse? Is there an inverse relationship? Yeah, is there an inverse relationship? One of the great things, so my, my idea with the concept of Nigeria, right? or Kenya, I'm sorry, Kenya, Nigeria, Africa, the idea is that, yeah, in all likelihood, and this is kind of an idea, we really want to submit a grant proposal, Dr. Zach, really a big grant proposal, where this is concerned. Um, the idea is that we would test and determine whether or not uh, strata, the socioeconomic scale, in neighborhoods across the country would use, if you're wealthy, you'd actually use more uh, in terms of renewable because you knew it was free. And not only that, but your demands. But then we'd also want to understand, or less because your education is such that you want to save the environment. But on the lower income strata, we want to see whether or not they actually increase their energy usage and how much savings they would do so and by what scale they would engage in private economic activity from their savings. So the idea is that you actually raise the living standards of low income families by using alternatives rather than the opposite. Right? So it goes along that idea. Yeah. All right, let's give another round of applause for Dr.